Okay, Rhonda. Hi. So Hi. first of all, welcome to our my podcast, which is I'm Fine, Save Me. And I have a guest here, and it's Rhonda. We're going through Zoom, which is different, but we're recording through Zoom. And we're also on TikTok Live. Um, but thank you very much for being willing to talk to me. Of course. So just to give people a little background, you are a social worker and you work for a hospice. You yes. before that, that hadn't been that long, but before that you worked in long-term care nursing homes mainly. In fact, almost as long as me, a long time. When long time. Nursing home, what year? 98? A 95. <laughs> oh, you longer than me, really, because I started in 98. <laughs> well, um really to i guess jump right into it you suicide has definitely affected you uh and it's affected you in two different ways you had your brother commit suicide and also you had your son's dad commit suicide you guys were divorced but still his father commits suicide which happened first um my son's dad okay. was two 2000 and what? 16. Mm. So just if you don't mind, give us a little background about what happened. I mean, just kind of what happened. And if sure. You we, we were married. We got married right out of high school or I was. Um, we were married for a little over 20 years. Got divorced. Um, Landon, I don't know. He was probably uh seventh grade maybe sixth or seventh grade um and so it was five years after we had gotten divorced that he killed himself he was remarried um things went awry with that and he ended up shooting himself yeah it's kind of interesting because that's a different perspective i mean it was your ex-husband but I mean, obviously, there's still lots of feelings and things even about somebody you've been married to. Sure. And then, but more importantly, uh, he's your only kid's dad. So how did you try? I mean, first of all, how did you help your son deal with all that? Because he was pretty young still. And he was 16. Yeah, he was 16. Um, I it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my entire life was what help him get through that. Um, I tried to be supportive, just if he wanted to talk about it, we talked about it. If he didn't want to talk about it, we didn't. Um, and that was usually the case. He didn't want to talk about it a lot. Um, mainly I tried to at least give the opportunity, you know, at least every day at some point I would check in and without any other interruptions and just give him the opportunity to talk about things or his day. And sometimes it would develop into, you know, that, and sometimes, you know, it didn't. Um, probably the other thing that I've tried to do, you know, because his, his main concern was he didn't want that to be anyone's last memory of his dad. He didn't want that to be his legacy. Yeah. And so I tried then, and I still do. If, if I think of anything that is a funny story or something that his dad would have enjoyed, or I thought his dad would have said, you know, I always try to say it to him, you know, I want him to know that we're going to remember the good times. We had lots of good memories before the last bad memories. We had lots of good ones. So I, I try to reinforce that. Do you, and, and that's really just a question. Did, did you try to do anything like counseling for him or anything yeah. to that effect? Yeah, he um he went to counseling for probably I would say a year, uh -huh. uh, you know, every couple of weeks, every two weeks, Before and that it was help. I think that it did. Um, I think at first it was, it was really hard. Honestly, to tell you the truth, I think it probably would have been better. I mean, not that we shouldn't have done it then, but I think probably even a couple of years later to have done some more probably would have been pretty helpful just because you're in such shock and just kind of survival mode and numb that I think there's lots of feelings and things that come out later and mm -hmm. um, one, th one thing he did do um two years later he did grief share which is a program that our church does for 
it's like a semester long class. You go once a week, get videos, you do a workbook, and then you meet with a group of people. Yeah. Um, he was the only kid in there. You know, a lot of them were, you know, older people, but there were some younger adults, but that was good for him. I, um, and, and I don't want to say too much. In other words, your son's not here on this conversation and, you know, right. I want to respect him and I want to be careful with it, but you did tell me one thing, and I think it's important for people to hear this that, and, and to understand it really, that there's a little bit of embarrassment. Like when he went back to school, he did not really necessarily want people to know what had happened. He was right. embarrassed by it. And, I, and, and again, I want to be careful because, you know, when you're 16 years old, I mean, how in the world? I, I struggle at my age on how to deal with all this stuff. So I can't even imagine at 16 years old when your brain's not fully developed and how you're, what you're thinking about it. But also, you know, one of the things that have really continued to pop up, you know, since my family's dealt with this is, uh, that we do have a tendency to hide it as a society and you know the stigma of it it's like we may we don't do not necessarily want people to know what happened especially somebody you love and very close right. so I mean what's your thoughts on all that well I mean you know his friends had been to his dad's house I mean they hung out they had done things together and so I mean, it's just a shock, you know, he was shocked and he really didn't want people to know. And in his 16 year old mind, you know, he wasn't necessarily thinking that people are going to know there's not a way to, for people to not know. Um, and that's just basically what I, you know, had to, to try to remind him of was people are going to know, you know, there's no way to hide that, but just, you know, my words to him were, if somebody asks you about it and you want to talk about it, then go ahead and if you don't want to talk about it, just tell them, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. And, and, you know, he never really, I don't believe had any issues with, with anybody as far as bringing something up that he wasn't comfortable with. I, I don't think that ever happened to him. Yeah. I, uh, I told this story last night and, and, and it reminded me because I, it's like, I guess the story came to my mind because of yours, yours and I's conversation and preparation for this interview. But, you know, I, I uh, as you know, I attempted suicide when I was 17 and was in the hospital for several days. And do you know that I went back to class? I wrote this in my journal and I forgot about it till last night when I was like looking at stuff. I went to class in the very first, I walked into Spanish class and the teacher basically announced it in front of the whole class that I attempted mm -hmm. suicide and, and I turned around and walked out. Yeah. And then I don't know if my mom talked to whoever, whatever happened, but it was never mentioned again. But yeah. it's, it's, it amazes me sometimes, even professionals like teachers. And, and again, mm -hmm. there's great teachers out there, but the insensitive and or not being sensitive at all, especially to a kid. And, you know, you can, say that 17, 16 and 17 year olds are not, but they are definitely still kids, you know, they haven't developed and they're trying to figure out how to, to get through that. Yeah. But, you know, and back to Landon, I mean, just so everybody know, I mean, your kids turned out to be a pretty good kid. He recently yeah. was married. Um, he is definitely in the ministry um, mm -hmm. involved. He's, he's a, an amazing musician. Um, it, do you see things, I mean, it will always affect him. I mean, that there's no doubt that his father and that relationship between his son and his father is really important. Do you see things that you, like maybe even at the wedding where you can tell that he's still affected by it? Or is there things that pop up that you see? Absolutely. I mean, I remember, you know, some conversations that we had even back not long after it happened. And then maybe a year or two later, he said, you know, I'm going to be sad at all the big things, you know, when I graduate from high school, when I graduate from college, when I get married, when I have kids, you know, I want them to know him and they'll never get to. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, all those things have, or most of those things have come about, um, you know, he graduated from high school. And so he's going to graduate this May from college. He got married last summer. Um, and so it's almost like just a little bit of a, sadness that kind of hangs over mm. all of those happy events yeah. um like for instance the the prayer there was a prayer um between um 
the parents, you know, they would come up and we prayed over the kids and I could just tell that that was really heavy on him, that his dad should have been there doing that. And he wasn't. Yeah. 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 What do, and, and again, you guys weren't married when this happened. So it's a little bit harder maybe to you, for you to have seen like red flags or signs. Did you, do you, did you see any signs that he was going to do this? I did. Um, really, I would say probably the last eight or nine years, he really struggled um, before he died. Um, there was a couple of times that he had overdosed and, you know, he said that it wasn't intentional. I believe, I believe it was, um, it just wasn't successful. Right. Um, he struggled with depression probably for the last 10 years before that. And, you know, I feel like the things that were kind of his demons, such as, you know, cheating, you know, sex, um, prescription medications that were either taken that weren't his or that were his that were, you know, overused. I believe all of that stuff was just self-medicating, you know, trying to, to make the, whatever pain, whatever depression, whatever was going on, he was trying to numb that, I think. And it, he just couldn't. Yeah. I don't think he wanted to do those things that he was doing to try to, to soothe that. I don't think he wanted to do those things. And so I, I think that added to the depression. You know, I'm already depressed. I'm, I'm struggling with it. And then now I'm doing these other things that I don't want to do. Mm. So you know, just that. I, I tell you, kind of every time we talked about this, um, there's one overwhelming feeling I have whenever I talk to you about it. And it's like, I just see the grace and mercy that you have about it all. And, and maybe it's primarily for your son. And I see that it's his dad. And but also it's like, you know, there was a lot of hurt there in the past. And there so was. in other words, you could hate this man, you know, because of the divorce and whatever happened. But I never hear that in your voice. Never, not one time have I heard. And, and again, probably because, you know, it's your son's dad. But I see like, I feel like you've forgiven this guy that you've, you know, that there's definitely compassion and mercy there. Um, how in the world do you think that's possible? Well, I mean, I, I'm a pretty forgiving person. I, I don't I really have to work at it much. It, it comes easily for me anyway. But I mean, we were 18 and 20 when we got married. So we were basically babies um, and we grew up together. And so, I mean, he was an important person in my life for 20 years. So that's not somebody that you just forget about I mean there's things there's still phrases or comments or things that I do today that I'm like that was a mic thing and I still do it you know yeah. um so I I mean he was a he was a good person he was a good person and that struggled and so I mean I see that there was a, at the point in time that I got divorced I knew that for my own mental health and sanity I needed to separate myself from that because it wasn't it wasn't good for me anymore. Um, I didn't want to, and I struggled with it and it made me very sad. Um, but I forgave him, you know, I didn't, I wasn't angry. I was hurt more than anything. I wasn't angry, but, um, this makes me sad, you know, that somebody to see somebody you love hurting and you can't fix it. I think that was the hardest thing was all those years, you know, I wanted to fix it. I didn't want him to be that way. I wanted, I wanted to help him yeah. and I couldn't, there was, there was nothing I could do to, to make it better. Do you, do you feel like there is any guilt associated with this in your, in you? A little bit. I think, um, you know, they always tend to go back to what if I, we hadn't got divorced. What if I would have stuck with it, you know? Um, what would have happened? I don't think that was the right thing to do. I think that, um, I think that eventually it would have happened anyway, yeah. just because he was struggling so much. Um, the suicide, I mean, I think that would have eventually happened, but still, um, there's some guilt that I think I'll always have a little bit. Yeah. What about, do you, do you sense some guilt in your son about it all? No, 
I don't. He's not expressed it anyway. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. There's times I think he's angry and he said that, you know, yeah. he said, I'm more recently, not back then, but as time goes on, he says, you know, it makes me angry at dad that he's not here for this, you know, and he loves him and he knows he struggles, but not angry in a can't get over it unforgiving way, but just, you know, yeah. dang it, you miss out on all this, you know, I, um, in some, in some ways, and this is kind of like, like I feel a little bit bad or guilty about this, but you know, we've known each other for several years and you've mentioned these things to me. And um, I, I wouldn't say I ignored it, but I think it's part of like, I buried it a little bit. It's funny, yeah. even what I was telling you about, like I just recently put it out there to the public about me attempting suicide at 17. Mm -hmm. It's almost like I blocked it out. It, it was real, you know, I was in the hospital for many days. So it was very mm -hmm. real. And then I think about like you, you and I friendship. And I think about the fact that we really did not talk about these things a lot until my cousin recently committed suicide. And right. then we brought it out because you were obviously trying to help and you were trying to be there for me. And I think about all that. And I think that's the mistake that we make. We just almost bury these things like we don't even it's like we know they're there it, it we're not really trying to hide it but it's like we're not facing the pain i don't think right. i ever faced the pain honestly mm -hmm. of what i did at 17 i, I yeah. don't think i ever did and i think recently by me putting out you know a tiktok about it um it's really like it's almost like i didn't want anybody to know that either i put it in a private journal and never to talk about it again. But I yeah. realized that for my own healing, I had to talk about it. And then talking with you, I realized that, you know, heck, I need to be the good friend that you were to me. And let's talk about your stuff too. And meaning mm -hmm. on this. And it's just, it ama I'm so amazed just because, you know, all the awareness that I've been putting out there, I'm amazed by everybody has a story mm -hmm. and it's crazy to me. And it's like, I think we bury it a little bit, you know, Again, we do. I, don't, I don't know if it's embarrassment or I think yeah. partly for years, mine was embarrassment. Like I was just embarrassed that yeah. I, I, I felt weak or, you know, whatever. So I, um, I, I think I part of um, a friend at work, um, our chaplain here the other day, or I, maybe it was maybe right when she started and she actually she saw Landon's picture and she was like I know him and so we talked a little bit and she realized that she was in grief share with Landon oh, yeah. back um her husband had passed away at a fairly early age but so we started talking about that and and she just asked me a question and I I don't like to tear up in front of people um but she looked at me and she said, well, she said, have you ever grieved over that? I mean, did you allow yourself to grieve? And I, I mean, I just felt my eyes fill up and I was like, I don't, I don't think I have, you know, I felt like not being married at the time to him. And I don't know. I, I think at the time I felt like I didn't necessarily have permission from whoever to, to do that. And so. That really brings something kind of crazy to my mind is that you probably felt like an outsider when this was all going on because you weren't his current wife. You were, mm -hmm. you were, it, it was a related subject because of your son. Right. But in some ways you probably felt like an outsider and it was probably hard for you to grieve at that time. It was a, it was a weird position for sure. Um, it happened on a Monday. No, no, no. Happened on a Sunday. And so I called my boss and said what had happened. And I said, I've got to take off all week. Um, Cause I thought I'm, I didn't want to leave Landon. Like I, I really didn't. I wanted to be there when he went to bed. I wanted to be there when he woke up. I didn't want to leave him. And I didn't for that whole week. And then the funeral was like on Friday or Saturday. Um, but I did, I guess I didn't feel like an outsider so much because he was so closely tied to it. Mm -hmm. And so basically, you know, whatever he was doing, I was doing. And so it was, I was still a lot involved in that. Um, Landon basically planned the majority of the funeral. Um, I'm, I'm so like that 
floor, you know, I talked about that with my aunt. I'm so floored by when when these people do this, and then their kids who are still kids are yep. having planned funerals. And mm -hmm. you know, you as I've told you, and you know that one of my cousin's daughters who had just turned 18 had to verbally give a DNR, do not resuscitate, over the phone. Yeah. So that they could save his organs for own organ donorship. Mm -hmm. I'm amazed by how these kids have to step up in these situations. Like yeah. you're saying, him planning the funeral. That yeah. had to be horrible. And I mean, you know, um, Mike's wife participated, obviously, but she was just so, oh, it was, she was heartbroken and numb and in shock, I think, probably for a little bit. And so all of that, it was, it was, gut-wrenching for her and so she she struggled but she you know she participated but Landon you know he picked out the songs he um picked out all the pictures he wanted in the video he you know he basically told I mean the the pastor you know preached the funeral but Landon had some specific points that he wanted him to make and so it was it was pretty neat I was proud of him I guess kind of what what I was really getting at too is that um, I think it was no accident that basically God put you in my life as a friend because truly, like even though I didn't recognize it at the beginning, um, it's kind of an instrumental part of like me healing and trying to understand it and and you can relate to it. It's not like you're just you know, somebody who's never dealt with it. And so I appreciate that very much. So let's talk about your brother. So then how long ago did he die? That was, Mike was 2016, Kelly was 2017. So your brother, younger or older brother? Younger, he, um, He's probably, he was 14 years younger than me. So he, quite a bit of an age difference. Yeah. So kind of tell us what happened there, the summary of what happened. So Kelly, all, we're all adopted and I have two younger brothers, Dusty and Kelly. And so my parent, I was 13 when my parents adopted them and they were one and two. Yeah. Um, they were taken out of an abusive, neglectful situation. And so I believe Kelly probably had some, you know, he was one and basically starved. And so I feel like that definitely affects, you know, your brain's development and all that. Mm -hmm. He had behavioral issues starting from the time he was four or five all through, you know, he would get mad if somebody told him no. And he would, you know, go through the house and turn over furniture. I mean, just really radical stuff for a little kid. Yeah. And so it just kind of escalated as he got older um and then he began to use drugs you know and drink um and I felt like probably as a self-medication to try to soothe all that um but as he got into his late 20s mid-20s it really became apparent I, I truly believe he was a paranoid schizophrenic um and he was undiagnosed and unmedicated obviously and so he got so paranoid that he you know he was couldn't hold a job because he was so paranoid that everybody was out to get him he would just have you know crazy behavior at work um he was divorced had two little kids um was homeless he would go live in his car down by the river he was a little bit abusive quite a bit abusive to my mom um verbally and emotionally he would you know guilt her into letting him stay there and then he would you know yell and scream at her and uh, to the point that it was scary you know he lunged at Landon at one point about a couple of years before all of this happened um because Landon saw him yelling my mama didn't like it um escalated to the point that he was paranoid living down by the river and I guess the police tried to pull him over um out by Lake Murray and he just pulled over on the side of the highway and went in front of his big Bronco and started shooting at them all. Um, and so, of course, their, you know, reply was to shoot back because he was 
I mean, he would have killed them if, if he could have. Yeah. And so anyway, that's, that's how he died. A suicide by cop. Basically. Yeah. Had he attempted suicide before this or that the first time? No, no, he hadn't. Um, he had made some threats that he would. Um, and then, you know, he said, I'm going to take all of you out first. And then myself, you know, he was, he was to the point that I was scared. I didn't want him to know where I lived. You know, if I moved to a different house and somehow he always found out, which was terrifying to me a little bit, but, um, it, it was sad to watch him because it was completely, you know, the mental illness. Yeah. Um, you know, he was my little brother and I loved him, but then, you know, the last, oh, five, six, seven years of his life, you know, I, I was truly scared of him. So it was, it was sad. And, you know, again, both of these, I can t go back to, there was some degree of mental illness. Obviously Kelly's was much more, you know, but. What, uh, how did, how did your mom, I mean, obviously it was de devastating for her. So how did she deal with this? Do you think did she deal with it? Well, did she try to get help? Or, I mean, how, how did she Deal she did it well um you know she'd watched him struggle and and honestly we had talked about the fact that if he didn't get help and continue down the road that he probably would be a homeless person that you would see walking down the street and not able to function really in society and um so I think it probably I'm not glad that it happened the way it did but I don't think there was a good ending to Kelly's story. My mom, however, she is a very, um, she has more faith than probably anybody I know. And so, you know, she relied on the Lord for strength and comfort and she really didn't miss a beat, honestly. You know, she, she's a strong lady. Same thing. Do you, do you feel any guilt or your own guilt about what happened to your brother? I don't with him. I, I don't think there was anything I could have done any differently that could have in any way affected what was happening with him. You know, I think that, and you bring it up and I've, you know, we, I've actually talked about this on the podcast before and it, especially like in my family, you wonder this question. I, I wonder this about like Landon, if he has this in his head that it's like genetic, you know, depression or even you know, the suicide part. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a, it's kind of a scary question, truthfully. I know, you know, genetically, your brother was not, you know, has the same blood as you because mm -hmm. adopted and you were adopted. But part of me, it's like, I, I do believe there is some genetic in there. But mm -hmm. then it's like, if it's just gen genetic, then we have no hope. You know what I mean? Right. And yeah. so you take somebody like your son or, you know, my, my cousin's kids, it's like, if it's just completely genetic, mm -hmm. we have no hope. And mm -hmm. so have you, and you, you are a mental health prof you know, professional, basically. I'll give you a high five for that. Anyway, uh, <laughs> what, what's your thoughts on all that? Um, I mean, it was scary for sure. In the very beginning, you know, I was terrified that that very thought, you know, crossed my mind and it was scary. Landon is a, a lot like my mom, his faith um, is very, very strong. And he'll, he told people then, and he'll tell you now that really that's what got him through mm -hmm. and was his strength through that. Um, and I feel like that definitely is still, you know, what, what keeps his peace today. Yeah. Um, do I think there's some genetic disposition, predisposition for depression and, and all of that? I definitely do. Um, there's even my biological family, my mom and my brother and sister, both, you know, they all struggle, not struggle, but have a diagnosis of depression and take medicine for it. So, you know, yeah. like you said, there, it definitely is, is something that I don't think you can just ignore, you know, and that's one thing I've tried to talk to Lena about is if, if you feel these things, you have to speak up. Yeah. You know, there's help, there's, there's medication that can help balance out chemical imbalances. There's, you know, and I don't just want to push medicine on anybody, but if you get to the point that it's interfering with your daily functioning, um, you, you've got to say it, you got to, 
you've got to wave the flag and ask for help. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that, I mean, we have a kind of preposition, pre say that word again. You have, we all, yeah, genetically we have good and bad, you know what I mean? Yeah. We have both. And so um, yeah. it definitely wasn't his upbringing. I, I mean, maybe right. before your mom, yeah. But the point is, is that there was something real there. In his case, in medicine, probably mm -hmm. it was been way more effective if oh, yeah. because of the severity of, you know, mm -hmm. schizophrenia and all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. Have you, have you ever, do you deal, struggle with depression? Um, there's been points in time that I think I have. It, I think for me, it manifests more as anxiety um, than what you think of as depression. Um, I would say now the last year I've definitely struggled a lot just because I had to have two shoulder surgeries. And so it basically cut out some important things in my life that I just had to quit. Um, you know, I think exercise is the best antidepressant there is. And so when I had to cut that out and I realized how important it was, it, I struggled for the last year, you know, trying to find my balance again, but I'm better, but yes. Ever I, constant, ever, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I, anxiety is more what I struggle with than depression. And that definitely is a genetic thing. I can see it in my biological brother. He, he has anxiety and I can see it in Landon. Landon's got some anxiety too that he's going to have to keep in check. You know, and I, this is not, I'm not a doctor. You're not a doctor. We're not experts on all things, clinical, medical, you know, but right. here's part of it. Like I just, to, for me to say it like this helps me understand it better. To me, it seems like if you're struggling with depression, it's usually about the past. And when you're, when you're struggling with anxiety, it's usually about the future. And so I, and again, somebody would say, no, that's not completely true, but that's the way for me, it simplifies things. And I noticed that most people either struggle one or the other. It's like the anxiety it's about seems to be about future events or what's going to happen, et cetera. And then the de yeah. depression to me, is like maybe guilt over the past or whatever. Right. Have you ever contemplated suicide? No, 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 Never, not once. No. Do you no. think that, do you think, do you, have you ever wondered why? Like, I mean, I I think there's definitely, there's something broken in that thinking pattern. You know, I, I don't think that we're, as human beings, I think we're wired for survival. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's just how our brains are. And so I think there's a, something is broken in, in that thought process. And either it's, you know, sometimes I think it comes from despair over this is never going to get better. Or, you know, I've, the, my best days are behind me and I don't have anything to look forward to. I think that some despair comes out of that. Um, I'm a pretty hopeful person, though. I, I tend to, even though I am anxious a lot about different things, I tend to be pretty hopeful. And so I think that, I think that helps. Yeah. Um, again, you and I talked about it quite a bit, but just for people that might be listening, it's like, and, you know, you work in hospice, meaning you work with people that are dying. You know, I mean, the, the, in that environment, it's, you know, the, the criteria is six months or less to live is the criteria. You know, so you've dealt with death a lot, you know, it's like, and, and I, you probably, I probably did not give you enough credit for this either, but whenever my cousin killed himself, he sent me books about it, depression, you know, about all of it. And mm -hmm. so, how do you deal with just the constant people dying? I mean, that's, you know, Rhonda, you and I worked in the same environment, but I, I don't think I ever, same thing, realized when you spend 20 plus years working with the elderly, mm -hmm. that you see a lot of people die. You and I would say before this year, if you had asked me, um, like my feelings on death. And I would, I would have told you I was numb to it. And it's because like in the beginning of my career, I would go to almost everybody's funeral mm -hmm. and then I quit doing it, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, but I don't think it's, 
I don't know that we give it enough credit to like people who work in that environment and how much death they actually deal with. I can literally name, I'm, a, I'm an administrator, I'm not a nurse, I'm not anything um, that's clinical like that. But do you know me personally, how many people I've literally walked into their room and they were dead and nobody knew it and I was the first to find them? Yeah. I mean, half a dozen at least. Mm -hmm. And so when you have your own personal story of death and suicide, all of it. So how, what is your advice to not, you know, not necessarily just um, in long-term care, but I'm saying in general to how to deal with just death and, and what's your advice on how to deal with it? I think um, you've got to talk about it. I think not being able to talk about it with somebody is probably the most detrimental thing to our mental health, you know, whether it's a friend or a pastor or if you a counselor or anything, a grief share group. I mean, somehow you've got to be able to express those feelings and maybe even things that you wouldn't have thought of. Maybe your friend will ask you or bring up or this a counselor will prompt you to think down a, a path that you hadn't. Um, I think talking about it is the most important thing. Yeah, I'd agree. And I, you know, I think for me, it's like this year has been such an eye opener because, you know, as I've told you before this year with my mom's dad, my cousin's dad, all these things, I, um, I would have said that I was healed. And from when I attempted suicide, I would have told you that, you know, depression and stuff that I'd struggled with. But it was an eye opener. All this stuff did was bring out all of it. And it yeah. brought it out like full force. Here we go. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it just proved to me that it's, there's more work to be done, I guess is the best way to say it. Well, that, and it just helps you realize talking with people, you realize that everybody's got something, you yeah. know, it be that you've had someone you know, commit suicide that you loved or that you attempted suicide. Um, but everybody's got different struggles. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes our, um, our tendency is to put on our, you know, our fake face and act like everything's fine. I mean, that's our, that's our reaction. As soon as someone says, how are you? I'm good. Well, I mean, I, I you say it whether you really are or not. Yeah, and so, it's yeah, it's horrible. Yeah. So I think that, um, being able to talk about it. We, you've got to be able to talk about it. You've got to have a, you know, a circle. My circle is not very big. I've got probably a handful of close friends on one hand. Um, and I could, you know, call any of them at any time and tell them something and they're going to love me no matter what. And so I think that's important. You've got to have a group of people, even if it's just one, you've got to have somebody that you can talk to um, and be real with. I think that probably one of your gifts is like just being able to empathize with people, you know, and, and of course it makes sense you're a social worker and, you know, that you have to empathize with people and basically put yourself in their place. I think you're really good at that. I do. And what I've noticed through all this for myself is I wasn't very good at that, you know, and maybe because it brought out my own pain or I don't know what it was, but so, I mean, that's definitely a gift that God's given you and, um, and I appreciate it. anything else that you think it would be important for people to know about any of this. Uh, I think the most important thing is if you think you might need help, you've got to ask, ask somebody you have to seek out, seek out a professional counselor or somebody. If you are, if you have those thoughts of harming yourself, you've got to ask for help. You've yeah. got to, because they're not going to go away. Yeah. And that, that's, I think that's so important. You know, that's one of my platforms is like ask for help. And mm -hmm. I just realized it's such a simple concept to just ask mm -hmm. for help, but mm -hmm. also realize how there is a, um, a stigma with asking for help too, because you start to think, or you think people think you're weak or that something's wrong with you. All these yeah. things, you're embarrassed about it. And if I, I think you're, you're, you're hitting, you're hitting the nail around the head is the fact is that we have got to ask for help and it, little help, big help, who cares? And I think I look, I, you know, with Mike, he, he was a nurse. 
Um, he stepped out of that for five or six years and did youth ministry full time. And so I think that was probably a lot of maybe why he didn't ask for help, you know, was the stigma, you know, I, I have all these people that I work with every day. And so I, I, he didn't want to say it out loud. Yeah. And I think that ultimately was detrimental. I, uh, church can be a great place to get help, but also probably more important. A lot of times we're embarrassed to go to the church to ask for help. And yeah. so I think that those friendships, um, and that's another thing through all this is that I've noted, like I, I, the, some of the people that I thought would really help didn't show up. And some of the people that I didn't think would help at all, I asked and they showed up. And it's, mm -hmm. I, I think we don't realize it doesn't matter. It's, somebody's going to show up if you just continue to ask for help. And yep. it may have come from the strangest, quietest, never thought they would show up place. Yep. And um, who cares what they think? Who cares what people think? That's right. So, because there's nothing worse than like your son having to plan his own father's funeral. There's absolutely nothing worse. Never happened. It shouldn't ever happen. Not, not of that. Yeah. And I, you know, that's, and I've said it, but I'll say it again. It's not the only thing, but it's a big thing that has kept me from ever harming myself mm -hmm. again is the mm -hmm. fact that, you know, I don't want my kids to have to deal with that. I don't. Yeah. So, yeah. all right, Rhonda, thank you so much for taking the okay. time to talk to me. You're welcome. Right, we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. Hold on. Let me stop the recording.